everybody. Welcome to Business Insights. We're a panel of industry thought leaders from business advisory, tax, risk management, property, superannuation and investments, employment and HR, give their insights into the current economic and financial landscape that impacts small to medium sized businesses around Australia during this pandemic and beyond. Just a note that our views and opinions shared on the webinar are designed to be general information only and are not designed or to be taken as specific advice for your personal or specific circumstances. Feel free to reach out to any of us or any member in this panel for any specific, specific advice to meet your requirements. So let's get started. My name is Lisa Garrido. I'll be your host this morning, introducing the panel of small business thought leaders in their area of expertise. We have Ian McLaughlin from Imperium Accounting and Tax. Hi, Lisa. Thanks very much. Welcome, everybody. Good day, good day. Sam Gureshi from MoneyClip Private Wealth. Hi, Lisa. Hello, everybody. Great to be here. We have Adam Lyle from O'Brien Palmer. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me, and welcome back to New South Files. Ah, thanks. I'm excited. And we have a special guest today, um, and Rob Skeen has nominated our one and only Susan um, from Cala Property. Susan Fakwa from Cala Property. Hi, thanks for having me today. It's great to be here. Oh, welcome, Susan. Now, Bernie Tuimau has just come in. So Bernard Tuimau from MGA Insurance Brokers. Bern? Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for having me, and sorry I'm late. All right, all right, all good. Okay, um, I think what we'd like to do is start off with Sam Gureshi this morning. Sam, what's what's your update? Um, yeah, so um, so a couple of things to cover off um, today. Uh, cover off on interest rates and then uh, markets. Uh, first, the interest rates themselves, they continue to hold steady at the moment. Unoccupied fixed rates are in the low twos and variable rates in the mid, mid twos in percentage terms. Uh, investment fixed and variable rates also sit in that mid twos um, uh, and going upwards. Reserve Bank uh, is presenting tomorrow to the business, business industry. So uh, that should give us some clues as to any other interest rate actions that they're going to be taking and going forward, um, given where the current interest rates are sitting. And of course, um, uh, next month we'll have the budget, which obviously will have some impact uh, potentially on, on that as well. Now, you would have heard about the NAB and CBA getting into different types of credit cards uh, to, uh, to fight the uh, buy now, pay later uh, type. So I thought I'd just cover off on that very briefly. Um, these cards are set up such that you pay a, a monthly fee without any interest charges. Uh, but to be honest with you, having looked at those um, um, based on the balances that you carry, you're still going to be paying an average rate of interest rates of um, you know, low digits to early digits in, in teens. 10, 12 percent. So, uh, my recommendation is, regardless of what you do, whether it's buy now, pay later, or, or one of these credit cards, you use them only as a point of convenience and not carry any outstanding balance over time, because it's still going to cost you dearly. Um, often, when the period they use these finishes, especially with buy now, pay later, they they become a twenty percent uh, credit card essentially. So, um, so not very good from that perspective. Uh, from a market's perspective, uh, essentially it's not going anywhere and it hasn't gone anywhere since uh, since June. Uh, last week, we ended up with a 0.1% increase over the over the week. Um, you may recall a few weeks ago, I talked about Apple hitting $2 trillion. Um, and at the time, you know, it was uh, bigger than Italy, three times as size as, uh, as Turkey in terms of their value. Um, and uh, since then, it's come off some 21% in just less than a month. So uh, it just goes to show that market is still very volatile and many things or very small things can move the market significantly. So reporting season is now finished, uh, Lisa, and, uh, and some of the dividends um, are starting to come through from those reporting. They're gonna be smaller than previous times. Um, I think we've talked about that in previous catch-ups that we've had. Uh, but of course, investors need to think about what they do with this money as it comes through. And, uh, and of course, uh, the options that you have is you, need, you can take it as cash, um, use it for your personal stuff, including paying off debt. Um, you can use the cash and reinvest it into new investments as, uh, as you see fit. And of course, you also have the opportunity to invest and uh, reinvest those into what we know as DRP or dividend reinvestment plan. And uh, that's basically what when you are reinvesting the money back into more shares of the same company. 
So companies normally offer these um, so that they can hang on to the cash and use that to run their business, pay off debt, expand, and so on. It's a bit similar to the way that we would use cash in our lives for our personal use. Um, so often they, they offer you a discount of between 1% and 10% to take the DRP. And they offer you uh, no brokerage payable. And obviously that makes it more cost effective for you as well. So DRP really works well when you have the conviction that a share prices will rise in the future. And by buying more now, essentially you're going to get more and more income and growth into the future. And, and it is certainly powerful. So just to put it in perspective for everyone, uh, ASX at the moment, the index is running at about 5,800. So uh, in, in very simple terms, if you bought the index back in the 1980s, it was worth about $100. And um, so $100 is now worth $5,800. And that reflects the movement of the prices going up or down in the share market. The, the things that we talk about all the time, you know, the market is booming, market is busting and so on. But if you simply add that DRP into that same mix of the 5,800, uh, believe it or not, that compounding impact is so huge that the 5,800 is now worth $65,000, which is 11 times as much as it is if you just thought about the share price alone and not think about the, uh, the income. So I really wanted to make sure that everyone understands that the big play in the market, and in fact, with most investments, um, is is less about capital gain, it's more about the income you earn over time. And that's where you're actually going to be able to use that to essentially run your life better. Now, at the moment, there are some indicators as well that shows some really, really big extremes of tradings, um, especially happening by retail investors, whilst professional investors continue to sit on the side or be less active. So again, I caution you to focus on very specific companies uh, and be very, very mindful not to be um, all in investing right now. Of course, you should uh, um, have a chat with your uh, advisor uh, or reach out to any other panel members here as required in terms of anything that you need. Back to you, Lisa. Thanks for that, Sammy G. That is amazing food for thought. And again, we urge um, our viewers um, to actually reach out to Sammy G or reach out to your advisor as he's, he's given us a lot of um, areas there to, to think about and to take caution with. Thanks, Sammy G. Bernard, over to you. Um, any updates in the world of risk management? Thanks, Lisa. A few weeks ago, I sort of mentioned that uh, in the June quarter, um, the general insurance markets made a uh, net profit after tax of uh, $1 billion. Although that number does sound impressive, that was still down 70% from this time last year. So the lines that are performing quite well in terms of profitability um, and increases in premium uh, are things such as the professional indemnity insurances or financial lines, which includes things such as directors and officers insurances. Now, the reason for this is, uh, as you can imagine, things such as COVID and um, you know, COVID has, has sort of increased, contributed to the increase of premiums. Um, so it's quite important for SMEs to, to make sure that they work with, you know, with um, their financial or insurance brokers to make sure that uh, premiums are stable. Um, it should, it's a good time to make sure that you review your professional indemnity insurances and make sure that you are getting the best value for money. The other lines of insurances that we have seen increases things such as the uh, property lines insurance, which most SMEs have. So this is your business pack insurance that covers things such as property and contents and stock. Um, theft cover as well and glass. So what we're seeing in the market is, is increases. Now, as, as you can imagine, it's quite quite a difficult time. Now, SMEs are doing it quite tough, uh, obviously with the downturn of the economy, but things such as insurances are going up in these certain lines. So it's important for you to, to speak with your insurance broker and make sure that you understand the reasons for the increase and make sure that you are reviewing your insurances on a regular basis. It tends to be a thing where, um, you know, when you look at cost cutting, insurance is one of those things that you do cut. Um, it's important for you that you understand that if you make a decision on cutting any insurances, that you understand the implications of what you decide to self-insure when you're getting rid of those insurances. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's the one thing that we're seeing at the moment. And another thing that's contributing uh, to an increase of property rates is things such as um, the bushfires that we saw during the December and, and January period. Um, things such as uh, uh, motor vehicle insurances, the premiums are pretty steady there, 
Um, that's probably been the most profitable lines of insurance. Um, again, the reason being is the contribution of COVID and, and the frequent the infrequency of, of commuters using their vehicles uh, during the lockdown um, has contributed in the profitability of um, you know the, the the motor lines insurances. So um, again, work with your insurance broker and advisor just to make sure that you are getting fair rates. Um, and quickly, just around the grounds, um, just insurance news this week. Um, touched on, I've been touching on this the last couple of weeks. Is um, you know the the quarantine act and the exclusion around the pandemic. You know that seems to be pretty topical at the moment. Um, there's a couple of cases running at the moment. Um, there's a case, a test case that's now um, with the New South Wales Courts of Appeal. Um, so everyone is uh, quite eager to see the result of that. And on a separate note. Um, the Star Group, who I'm sure we've all been to the Star City Casino at one time or another, um, they've also got a separate case going on at the moment uh, with Chubb Insurance as the lead insurer and a couple of other insurers as well as, as the following lines insurance. So, look, it's a quite important time. My advice uh, before I finish up is to ensure that you work with your current insurance broker to make sure that you're getting the advice that you should be getting. Um, not just cutting costs, but understanding what costs you are getting, cutting, um, and understand the implications that might have um, from a risk perspective. Lisa, that's all from me. Great, thanks, Bernie. I've got a question for you at the Q&A part of the, the session on claims, so hold that thought. Um, Adam Lyle, over to you. Hi, Lisa, and thanks for that. I apologise for my instability of my camera. I've had a collapse uh, midstream through Bernard's there. I'd, it wasn't that he was shaking to me to my core uh, with uh, concern, but um, I thought I'd uh, cover off a few things. So this week covers uh, is um, is an interesting milestone. It's going to be six months since the emergency measures were put in place by the Australian federal government. And funnily enough, some of those measures, not all, have been extended to 31st of December. So we're six months in. And I'd like to, everyone who's viewing this today and those who will see it online later, to ask yourself three questions. Number one, are you strong? Is your business strong enough to sustain continued forward momentum? Are you strong enough to acquire other businesses? Would you like to increase your market share? Some of the businesses that are out there that uh, even those who are uh, in fact, um, clients of the speakers that are online today are in this position. Why? Because they've listened to the advice. They know their numbers. They get in touch with the right people at the right time. They look after their people. They're adequately insured and they make sure they think about things strategically with a calm, considered approach to make sure that they can move forward well into the future. This is a really healthy place to be. The second question is, are you just holding water? Are you in a situation where, you know, you're surviving, you're getting through it, um, you're not growing, but you're not losing money? Uh, JobKeeper, uh, if it comes, it's a bonus. Uh, it, you, you're paying your loans, you, you've You've had your six month moratorium, but you're back paying your loans and you're able to sustain a cash flow neutral or a cash flow positive uh, position moving forward. That's also a good position to be in. But identify what are the things in your business that are dragging you down, that are holding you back even from moving into that next level up. The third one is if JobKeeper had to be. Uh, had, if you didn't qualify for JobKeeper 2.0 or you had to pay back your loans with your bank pretty much instantaneously from 1 October or you had to pay your wages in full or you had to pay your rent in full and the answer to all of that is that you couldn't afford to sustain your business moving forward, now is the time to get the right advice. I'll give you an example. Uh, I'll, I'll change the name for the purposes of protecting their identity. Joe Blow Proprietary Limited came and saw me last Friday. They actually had in the situation where they knew they weren't going to qualify for JobKeeper 
their bank had already issued them a notice and saying they needed to pay their bills and their loans immediately. And their landlord um, closed, wanted to, to terminate the lease based on arrears with rent. And they had given them notice that on 1 October, they were going to lock them out. The reality with that situation is it's highly stressful and very emotional. But with a calm, considered approach, we're able to renegotiate a couple of those outcomes for them and get them into a situation where they could survive and get from that third level up into that holding water so they could at least give themselves time and space to reassess. I guess my point is this, please reach out for advice external to your own normal people that you speak to and guess who they listen to? They were listening to people at the pub on Friday afternoon. It's not healthy. You need professionals who know what they're doing. In that scenario, they had staff that were walking out their door, left, right and centre. Um, and they were actually getting advice about, oh yeah, just let them go. It's just crazy. So please, in that scenario, we're able to help save uh, elements, but not all of their business enterprise. So I hope everyone takes that warning on. The moratorium has been extended until 31 December, but there's been no confirmation of the rental relief just yet. And there's no confirmation yet about what the bank's position is after 1 October. Um, it hasn't been announced widespread. I suspect Sam is right. It will be announced within the announcements that they will uh, carry out today and tomorrow um, and certainly later in the week. I'll we'll see how we go. Good luck over the next quarter. It's been a wonderful um, opportunity for all of us to give you some good hints and tips throughout this period and, and we certainly want to continue to do so. Um, that's all for me. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Adam. Really wise words. Uh, and the biggest takeaway there is that it's never too late, guys. Always make sure, um, act now and seek the right advice. And I, I don't know anyone more thoughtful and considered and calm than Adam, even as he's talking about it this morning. Now, over to you, Ian. I'm sure there's so much more um, to learn about JobKeeper 2.0. Over to you. Thanks, Lisa. I will talk about JobKeeper 2.0 today because we do have the Royal Assent. The legislation has passed. We have the amending rules from Treasury and we have the legislative instruments from the ATO. So it's really important that we talk about JobKeeper 2.0 today because JobKeeper 1.0 ends this Sunday, which is the 27th of September. And then JobKeeper 2.0 starts from the 28th. So what I thought I would do is, is just run through the basics and then just a couple of tips at the end. So you remember with JobKeeper 1.0, how the payments were 1500 a fortnight per eligible employee or eligible business participant. Well, with JobKeeper 2.0, it's in two tranches. And this is the way I want people to think about it. So the first tranche of JobKeeper 2.0 runs from the 28th of September to the 3rd of January, 2021. Now, in order to qualify for that, the business is going to have to see a drop in turnover of 30% or more comparing their September actual 2020 numbers compared to their September 2019 numbers. So there's a bit of difference there with JobKeeper 1.0 because you might remember that with 1.0, you could use a projected turnover. But with JobKeeper 2.0, it is the actual turnover and the ATO is going to be uh, comparing BASs lodged uh, to the figures that are provided to the ATO. So with the first tranche that runs until the end of the year, the payments drop from 1500 a fortnight to 1200 a fortnight for employees who work more than 20 hours in the period. And then for employees who work less than the 20 hours in the, in the period, it is $750 a fortnight. So that's literally slash that payment in half from 1500 to to 750. Now the second tranche of JobKeeper 2.0 runs from the 4th of January 2021 until the 28th of March. Now like we saw with the first tranche, the payments dropped from 1500 to 1200. They now drop to 1000 for employees who work more than 20 hours or eligible business participants that are involved in the business more than 20 hours in the relevant period. Uh, and then for the ones that aren't, it drops to 650. Okay, so 
is a, is a big drop there. Now, to get that second tranche, you're going to have to compare your actual December 2020 turnover compared to your December 2019 turnover. Now, I know a question that's uh, come through a lot is, is what is included in the, in, the, in the GST turnover and how do we do it? Well, if you report your BAS on a cash basis, then that's the turnover that we've got to look at. We've got to look at your cash turnover. Likewise, if you report your BAS on an accruals basis, then we have to look at your accruals turnover. Now, a question that's come through also is, what about the JobKeeper payments that I've received on JobKeeper 1.0? Are they included in my turnover? Well, the answer is no. So just a couple of other things that I might point out now that we've got the legislation and it's quite clear, is that the employees do not need to do new forms. So you might remember with JobKeeper 1.0, the employees had to sign declaration forms. They do not need to do new forms and you do not need to re-enroll the employees. So that's just a bit of a brief summary. Um, I am gonna be running a separate webinar on, on Wednesday where we're gonna cover the more, the finer details of JobKeeper 2.0 uh, in a lot more detail. So if you want to register for that, reach out, let me know and I'll send you the link. Um, but we'll be covering off some more next week as well. So thanks very much, Lisa. Thanks, Ian. So for our viewers, it's Ian at imperiumaccountingandtax.com.au. Is that right, Ian? I'm Hang on. on. That's yep. right. It's uh, Ian at imperiumaccounting.com.au. Okay, great. So reach out. I'm registered for that session too, Ian. That's great. Good to know. And now, Susan, now we're so excited to hear from you, particularly about property investment, especially after Sam has given his update. Over to you. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I'm Susan from Colour Property, and uh, I've researched markets all over Australia to consistently identify the right property in the right place at the right time. Um, and Adam, you made a really good point there about, you know, the, the chatter that goes on at the pub. I was at the pub on Saturday with some friends and, uh, you know, a friend of a friend came over and started talking about the market. And I think that's a really important thing to remember is that Australia is made up of lots of different markets. We have 550 postcodes and, and over 100 different, you know, specific kind of regions that we would consider an investment market. So that's really where we come into play. So um, what we have found over the COVID period is the areas that we are recommending based on the research that we have been conducting for years, but in particular in the lead up to COVID, we're finding that there has been, they're very resilient markets. Um, the economies are strong and diversified, but importantly, the buyers are active. There's not a lot of stock for sale. The vacancies are ultra low and in some areas are falling. The rents are increasing and prices are stable and rising. So a really great example is, and some of you will have, met, will have heard me speak about this before, um, the Sunshine Coast and Geelong are two regions that have been performing very well over the last few years and, and regions that I expect to continue to form to perform well because they just have the fundamentals in terms of the drivers in the economy. Now, that's all about the capital growth, which is obviously for most people a long-term uh, consideration and that's really where people make the most amount of money in property is through the capital growth. However, if you do not have the rentals um, the, the rent coming in and that's that income stability to substantially cover the cost of your property, there's a very good chance that it will negatively impact on your lifestyle too greatly and you'll be forced to sell the property. So you'll never realise the capital growth. So a really good example of this is even though we have seen with the properties that I've recommended over the last couple of years, we've seen growths of between 21 and 26% just in the last 18 months. Um, I had a client who settled on a two bedroom townhouse in um, on the Sunshine Coast, about seven minutes from the $1.6 billion teaching hospital, which is the largest teaching hospital in the Southern Hemisphere, close to the 81 million upgraded university, um, as well as a, a lot of other things uh, that have pointed to that area being a really good, good area for growth. And I said, look, you know, my client's about to settle. What, you know, how, how are things looking? 
and uh, the client was settling on the Wednesday and on the Friday and Saturday, so Friday they opened up online inspections and on Saturday they had 204 inspections online and 76 applications. Wow. So, you know, it just goes to show, and, and we went back through the historic vacancy rate in, I think it was in June, don't quote me on this, but I think in June it was 2.1, uh, sorry, 1.2%. This area was now 0.6%. So that's, you know, that shows that there is a lot more demand than there is supply. Now, some of the reason for that is, you know, when COVID hit and that, that impacted construction, even though construction is considered a, an essential service, Trying to socially distance on a construction site proves difficult at times and often meant that projects were either longer to complete or were shelved altogether. Just developers who were who had uh, plans at council just said, look, let's just leave it there. Councils have actually been more adversely affected than construction sites. Uh, and that's often where we have found the slowdown to be. But the point of this is that if you get the research right, you can not only make sure that a good crisis doesn't go to waste, but you are in a resilient space when a crisis or if a crisis does hit. And it's very heartening for me to know that I'm on the right track with this research that I bang on about all the time, because the areas that I've recommended and the clients who I have uh, you know, ha who have invested in areas that I've rec recommended have not had any adverse impacts from COVID. So, it, you know, it's one thing that people are looking at at the moment is how to take advantage of uh, some of the incentives that the government uh, has at the moment. I think what differentiates this crisis from previous economic shocks, especially the GFC, is that there is a lot of liquidity in the market and the government is able to offer a lot of incentives for builders, for um, stamp duty concessions, um, first homeowners grants. So we've had a number of clients say, well, how can I take advantage of this? And if you're in a position where you can, you can invest in a property as a first homeowner or even as an owner with the intention of, of renting it out further down the track. So it's a short-term ownership, but for a long-term investment, it's still really important that you get the investment part of it right and make sure that you have the research right. Um, and time is really running out to take advantage of so, some of those incentives. So um, if you'd like to find out more about that, you're welcome to give me a call or get in touch with me at Cala Property, that's C-A-L-L-A -L -L -A Property. Um, but yeah, it's actually a really great time to invest. It's uh, hard to find, some, in some areas it's hard to find good stock, but we've, we've done very well in maintaining our stock levels and ensuring that we have really good properties for investment purposes. For our clients. Great, thanks Susan. Um, again, it's like invest in well researched work, and that's Cala Properties core proposition and unique value proposition. Thank you, Susan, for your time. Thanks, and speaking of resilience, um, Sam Gureshi, a, um, a fortnight ago, you asked if I could put together something on how to motivate your team or keep them motivated in this crisis. Well, okay, that's a bit of a challenge, but all right, I've, I've been banging on about connectivity and connection. Um, and so that's my first step, remain connected. Um, but um, for managers and team leaders, focus on yourself, focus on self-awareness, start with yourself basically. Whether you're thinking of the general well-being of your team members or whether you're thinking of your own well-being, try and work out when um, the red flags start coming about for your team. I covered this in a session a few uh, weeks ago. Um, we need to be a bit more human and vulnerable as leaders um, in that you need to show your team members that you are also being affected by this crisis and share with them the little steps that you take to keep yourself, your health and mental well-being um, together and develop a bit of resilience as Susan was talking about. Um, this is the golden ingredient to survive and thrive. It's resilient. So ask yourself as a manager, how are you going? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you fatigued? And how fatigued are you? Are you beginning to get really cranky when you're having team meetings? Are you being short? Yes, I am short. 
but are you being short with your staff and team members? Watch out for these roadblocks on productivity um, and fatigue. Um, it's not as easy when you're managing people remotely, but use technology. Um, there's things like Slack, Scott for Business, uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, there's a, a new software that I'm looking at for one of my clients called Discord, and there's heaps of communication tools available for you to be able to touch base and connect with them on an immediate basis. Ask around, ask your colleagues, your networks, your other business, um, you know, competitors and, and um, advisors what they use in terms of technology on that. So that's my first tip, connection. It's extremely important to keep everyone motivated. Secondly, is promote learning and development programs. Make sure this is not just job specific. It could be um, anything that relates to um, their, to, to develop soft skills. Um, Try not to focus too much on formal courses, you know, to increase CPD points if you're in that particular industry. Um, most of my clients now have weekly or fortnight, fortnightly lunch and learns where um, team members are there to offer their expertise. It's not always coming from management um, or they discuss situations that are more complex and how to go about it how to resolve a client situation, for instance. And it's so it's geared so that it's a, more like a workshop of learning, more like a studio environment. Get keynote speakers, uh, motivational speakers, people in health and mental well-being. These are learning and development programs that are outside of being job specific. Third point, have regular one-on-one -on -one sessions. Very important. You need to create that kind of support um, to your team members to, for the new normal. In that one-on-one, -on -one, people feel heard, they feel safe, they feel like you definitely look after them, ask how they're feeling, ask open-ended questions and really listen to what they have to say. This is your chance to be a coach, not a manager. So these are soft skills that we now need to start developing. Share your own life experience and professional experience when they talk about their challenges. Things are not as they seem. So make sure you have one-to-ones. For those that can have one-to-ones on a face-to-face -face basis, do that. Um, if you have rostered shifts and people are coming to the office, take that opportunity to connect with them on a one-to-one -one basis. And that's in line with the connection point that I've talked about one. Um, earlier. If in the one-to-one -one they're asking for help, feel free to jump in and help them resolve that situation um, or facilitate that attitude for change. Fourth point, play games. Create competitions in achieving little goals. Um, Gino Wickman in his philosophy um, called Traction calls it rocks. These are the little priorities that you've identified as a team that need to be achieved. Create competitions around achieving them, create reward systems and little contests, create um, um, you know, communication. One of my clients has a weekly competition on which team member exhibits one core value in the business. And it's a movie voucher, it's a coffee voucher. And they then get to judge the next team member that exhibits the next core value. Things like that, be very creative and have fun with it. Point number five, don't forget that your normal way of celebrating pre-COVID, anniversaries, birthdays, um, recognition sessions, continue to celebrate them regardless of whether people are working from home. If you have a COVID marshal, you should also have a happiness marshal in the business. Get out in the open is my sixth point. If you have your team meetings at lunch, let them walk out and have the team meeting out in the open. Bring their laptops with them. Let them have some fresh air. Don't have lunch at your desks. Encourage them to get out and move about. Um, this then allows for them to have that space between the desk and the monitor and have some connection with nature. Point number seven, rewards and incentives are very important. This is all about gratitude and appreciation. How to keep people motivated? Don't just think of a monetary reward. In fact, most businesses are managing their cash flows. So think about the bottle of favorite red that they would like to thank them. Think about when you're out for a cup of coffee, think of them and bring, a, bring them back a cup of coffee yourself. Um, send them a gift hamper that's bespoke to thank them. Um, offer them a mental health day on the house 
if you can manage to do that. Give them a massage voucher, a, a, you know, a session with a chiro or a physio or a podiatrist if they're runners. Anything that means a lot to them. That's point number seven. And lastly, don't deviate from your HR strategy in the career development and planning. Use clear goal setting structures to help you and your team be aligned with a timeline that focuses on the big picture, the big outcome, despite our COVID situation. So all in all, guys, as team leaders and managers, those of you who are listening, we are now developing a raft of new skills in our management team. This is not about managing tasks or managing output alone. This is about learning how to adapt as mentors and coaches to business. So that's it for me. Hope, hopefully, Sam, that's, that gives you some ideas. Um, and I tried to bank that, you know, for like for the last two weeks, um, looking at my experiences with clients there. So that's it from the panel. Now over to the panelists. Do we have any questions? I've just, just got feel a free. Quick, yep. I've just got a quick question for Ian. I know that the employees don't need to sign for JobKeeper 2.0 now, but how is the reporting going to be between the business owner and the tax office about the amount of hours? Because they've got to be... For example, they've got to do 20 hours to be able to get the full um, amount of job. But what's the reporting mechanism for that going to be looking like? Well, it's funny, actually, because I was on a, a webinar before with Zero and uh, someone had that exact same question. So, and, and Zero said that they are not going to be introducing any, um, any special boxes that can be ticked there. But what the ATR has said is that you are going to have to keep good records of it. Um, and you know, it's not one thing that's not have to going to be submitted, but you are going to have to have the, the records of it. So, um, you know, the idea would be that through single touch payroll, um, you know, this is adding an additional note to the pay slip as to how many hours have been worked for that, for that particular period. That's what I would be doing. That's a good idea, Ian, actually good, yeah. good for me to note, um, for, for our clients as well. Um, Bernie, I've got a question for you. You're talking about some sectors in insurance that are obviously increasing in profitability um, and you've touched on claims. Have you done any research or is there anything on insurance news as to where the claims are coming from now? Because obviously motor claims are low, hence the profitability in the motor portfolio. But where are the claims coming from now? Uh, the main claims are sort of coming around the professional um, indemnity right. and finance lines, um, as you can imagine, um, you know, this is quite a difficult time for everyone. Um, you know, so policies that are impacted are things such as pro profession indemnity employment related claims because people are getting laid off at the moment. Um, directors and officers insurances around insolvency for those who do have insolvency cover under their um, management liability policy. So, you know, that's where, you know, the claims are coming from. Um, there's still quite a big lag um, on, um, you know, the catastrophe claims that we've seen um, in the previous months, in particular around, um, you know, the fires and the bushfires. So there's still, you know, quite a big area in terms of uh, claims that have been paid out from that catastrophe. So there's a, a slow lag um, in the impact on premiums um, is, because of those those areas. Thanks, Bern. And it's it's a frightening thought that summer is just around the corner yet again. So <laughs> hopefully there aren't any of those any more of those um, property claims when it comes to any more natural disasters. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Uh, yes, Benny. Benny, I got a question for you. With just with the um, with the insurance uh, premiums due to COVID, a lot of insurance companies um, put freezes on, etc. Can you just remind us as to, firstly, if those freezes are on, are people covered or they don't have cover while it's on a freeze? And how long will those freezes continue? So in terms of the actual freezes, and there, there, weren't, too many, there weren't freezes uh, per se in terms of holding policy periods. Um, some insurers, look, the party's well and truly over in terms of uh, insurers, uh, you know, uh, extending premium options uh, and payments and things and deferrals. Um, insurance brokers such as myself are sending out heavies to collect their premium because obviously if they don't get paid, um, they can't pay the insurance premium and there's a massive, huge flow-on effect. Now, I will say one thing though is how using an insurance broker and insurance advisor automatically gives you um, the edge because we have various uh, payment and credit terms varying from 30 days, in some cases, 90 days. And 
Um, so we're able to leverage, uh, you know, we're able to leverage ourselves in the amount of business that we have with particular insurers to make sure that we can try and get the best payment terms for our clients. And that's also offering cash flow, um, you know, things that will help with cash flow, such as the premium funding options and pay by the month options. So, you know, during this time, it's important to communicate. You know, if you are struggling to, to pay your bills, um, communicate with your insurance broker. You know, we're able to use our leverage and use our science to be able to communicate to the insurers uh, when you're able to, to pay those premiums. Um, so, look, the party is well and truly over. You know, some insurers that are still offering some deferrals. Um, but, um, you know, it's, 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 you know, everything's been on hold for such a long time. It's now, you know, it's, it's time for insurers to collect from their debtors, basically. So. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Bern. Um, if that's it from the panel, Susan, do you have any questions um, or any other feedback? Oh, just unmute yourself. Sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. fine. Thank you, Rita. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us, Susan. Hope to see you again in the next few weeks. And to all our viewers, again, don't hesitate to reach out to us on Facebook, on LinkedIn. Each of us have our own LinkedIn profile, so please don't hesitate to send us a message. And to all of you panelists, you have an awesome day. It's going to be 30 degrees. Enjoy the warmth. Thanks, Susan. Bye. Thank you, everybody.